section seventy seven of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli on the hero of hudibras butler vindicated that great original the author of hudibras has been recently censured for exposing to ridicule the sir samuel luke under whose roof he dwelt in the grotesque character of his hero the knowledge of the critic in our literary history is not curious he appears to have advanced no further than to have taken up the first opinion he found but this served for an attempt to blacken the moral character of butler having lived says our critic in the family of sir samuel luke one of cromwell's captains at the very time he planned the hudibras of which he was pleased to make his kind and hospitable patron the hero we defy the history of whiggism to match this anecdote as if it could not be matched whigs and tories are as like as two eggs when they are wits and satirists their friends too often become their victims if sir samuel resembled that renowned personification the ridicule was legitimate and unavoidable when the poet had espoused his cause and espoused it too from the purest motive a detestation of political and fanatical hypocrisy Footnote in a pamphlet entitled mercurius manipius the loyal satirist or hudibras in prose published in sixteen eighty two and said to be written by an unknown hand in the time of the late rebellion but never till now published is the following curious notice of sir samuel which certainly seems to point him out as the prototype of hudibras whose back or rather burthen showed as if it stooped with its own load the author is speaking of cromwell and says i wonder how sir samuel luke and he should clash for they are both cubs of the same ugly litter this urchin is as ill-carved as that goblin painted the grandam bear sure had blistered her tongue and so left him unlicked he looks like a snail with his house upon his back or the spirit of the militia with a natural snapsack and may serve both for tinker and budget too nature intended him to play at bowls and therefore clapped a bias upon him one would think a mole had crept into his carcass before tis laid in the churchyard and rooted in it he looks like the visible tie of aeneas bolstering up his father or some beggar woman endorsed with her whole litter and with a child behind End of footnote comic satirists whatever they may allege to the contrary will always draw largely and most truly from their own circle after all it does not appear that sir samuel sat for sir hudibras although from the hiatus still in the poem at the end of part one canto one his name would accommodate both the metre and the rhyme but who said warburton ever compared a person to himself butler might aim a sly stroke at sir samuel by hinting to him how well he resembled hudibras but with a remarkable forbearance he has left posterity to settle the affair which is certainly not worth their while but warburton tells that a friend of butler's had declared the person was a devonshire man one sir harry rosewell of ford abbey in that county there is a curious life of our learned wit in the great general dictionary the writer probably dr birch made the most authentic researches from the contemporaries of butler or their descendants and from charles longville the son of butler's great friend he obtained much of the little we possess the writer of this life believes that sir samuel was the hero of butler and rests his evidence on the hiatus we have noticed but with the candour which becomes the literary historian he has added the following marginal note whilst this sheet was at press i was assured by mr longville that sir samuel luke is not the person ridiculed under the name of hudibras 
it would be curious after all should the prototype of hudibras turn out to be one of the heroes of the roliad a circumstance which had it been known to the co-partnership of that comic epic would have furnished a fine episode and a memorable hero to their line of descent when butler wrote his hudibras one colonel roll a devonshire man lodged with him and was exactly like his description of the knight whence it is highly probable that it was this gentleman and not sir samuel luke whose person he had in his eye the reason that he gave for calling his poem hudibras was because the name of the old tutelar saint of devonshire was hugh de bras i find this in the grub street journal january seventeen thirty one a periodical paper conducted by two eminent literary physicians under the appropriate names of bavius and mavius footnote bavius and mavius were dr martin the well-known author of the dissertation on the aeneid of virgil and dr russell another learned physician as his publications attest it does great credit to their taste that they were the hebdomadal defenders of pope from the attacks of the heroes of the dunciad End of footnote and which for some time enlivened the town with the excellent design of ridiculing silly authors and stupid critics it is unquestionably proved by the confession of several friends of butler that the prototype of sir hugh de bras was a devonshire man and if sir hugh de bras be the old patron saint of devonshire which however i cannot find in prince's or in fuller's worthies footnote, there is great reason to doubt the authenticity of this information concerning a devonshire tutelar saint mr charles butler has kindly communicated the researches of a catholic clergyman residing at exeter who having examined the voluminous registers of the see of exeter and numerous manuscripts and records of the diocese cannot trace that any such saint was particularly honoured in the county it is lamentable that ingenious writers should invent fictions for authorities but with the hope that the present authors have not done this i have preserved this apocryphal tradition End of footnote. this discovers the suggestion which led butler to the name of his hero burlesquing the new saint by pairing him with the chivalrous saint of the county hence like the knight of old did sir knight abandon dwelling and out he rode a kernelling this origin of the name is more appropriate to the character of the work than deriving it from the sir hudibras of spencer with whom there exists no similitude it is as honourable as it is extraordinary that such was the celebrity of hudibras that the workman's name was often confounded with the work itself the poet was once better known under the name of hudibras than of butler old southern calls him hudibras butler and if any one would read the most copious life we have of this great poet in the great general dictionary he must look for a name he is not accustomed to find among english authors that of hudibras one fact is remarkable that like cervantes and unlike rabelais and sterne butler in his great work has not sent down to posterity a single passage of indecent ribaldry though it was written amidst a court which would have got such by heart and in an age in which such trash was certain of popularity we know little more of butler than we do of shakespeare and of spencer longville the devoted friend of our poet has unfortunately left no reminiscences of the departed genius whom he so intimately knew and who bequeathed to longville the only legacy a neglected poet could leave all his manuscripts and to his care though not to his spirit we are indebted for butler's remains his friend attempted to bury him with the public honours he deserved among the tombs of his brother bards in westminster abbey but he was compelled to consign the bard to an obscure burial place in paul's covent garden footnote he was buried outside the church in the angle at the northwest corner where the wall originally stood which bounded the churchyard 
End of footnote many years after when alderman barber raised an inscription to the memory of butler in westminster abbey others were desirous of placing one over the poet's humble gravestone this probably excited some competition and the following fine one attributed to dennis has perhaps never been published if it be dennis's it must have been composed in one of his most lucid moments near this place lies interred the body of mr samuel butler author of hudibra he was a whole species of poets in one admirable in a manner in which no one else has been tolerable a manner which began and ended in him in which he knew no guide and has found no followers footnote a monument was put up in the church in seventeen eighty six by a subscription among the parishioners it exhibits a bust of butler and a rhyming inscription in very bad taste End of footnote. to this brief article i add a proof that that fanaticism which is branded by our immortal butler can survive the castigation folly is sometimes immortal as nonsense is sometimes irrefutable ancient follies revive and men repeat the same unintelligible jargon just as contagion keeps up the plague in turkey by lying hid in some obscure corner till it breaks out afresh recently we have seen a notable instance where one of the school to which we are alluding declares of shakespeare that it would have been happy if he had never been born for that thousands will look back with incessant anguish on the guilty delight which the plays of shakespeare ministered to them footnote see quarterly review volume three page one hundred and eleven where i found this quotation justly reprobated End of footnote. such is the anathema of shakespeare we have another of butler in an historic defence of experimental religion in which the author contends that the best men have experienced the agency of the holy spirit in an immediate illumination from heaven he furnishes his historic proofs by a list from abel to lady huntingdon the author of hudibras is denounced one samuel butler a celebrated buffoon in the abandoned reign of charles the second wrote a mock heroic poem in which he undertook to burlesque the pious puritan he ridicules all the gracious promises by comparing the divine illumination to an ignis fatuus and dark lantern of the spirit footnote this work published in seventeen ninety five is curious for the materials the writer's reading has collected End of footnote. such are the writers whose ascetic spirit is still descending among us from the monkery of the deserts adding poignancy to the very ridicule they would annihilate the satire which we deemed obsolete we find still applicable to contemporaries the first part of hudibras is the most perfect that was the rich fruit of matured meditation of wit of learning and of leisure a mind of the most original powers had been perpetually acted on by some of the most extraordinary events and persons of political and religious history butler had lived amidst scenes which might have excited indignation and grief but his strong contempt of the actors could only supply ludicrous images and caustic raillery yet once when villainy was at its zenith his solemn tones were raised to reach it footnote the case of king charles i truly stated against john cook master of gray's inn in butler's remains End of footnote the second part was precipitated in the following year an interval of fourteen years was allowed to elapse before the third and last part was given to the world but then everything had changed the poet the subject and the patron the old theme of the sectorists had lost its freshness and the cavaliers with their royal libertine had become as obnoxious to public decency as the tartuffes butler appears to have turned aside and to have given an adverse direction to his satirical arrows the slavery and dotage of hudibras to the widow revealed the voluptuous epicurean 
who slept on his throne dissolved in the arms of his mistresses the enchanted bower and the amorous suit of hudibras reflected the new manners of this wretched court and that butler had become the satirist of the party whose cause he had formerly so honestly espoused is confirmed by his remains where among other nervous satires is one on the licentious age of charles the second contrasted with the puritanical one that preceded it this then is the greater glory of butler that his high and indignant spirit equally satirized the hypocrites of cromwell and the libertines of charles end of section seventy seven section seventy eight of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli shenstone's schoolmistress the inimitable schoolmistress of shenstone is one of the felicities of genius but the purpose of this poem has been entirely misconceived johnson acknowledging this charming effusion to be the most pleasing of shenstone's productions observes i know not what claim it has to stand among the moral works the truth is that it was intended for quite a different class by the author and dodsley the editor of his works must have strangely blundered in designating it a moral poem it may be classed with a species of poetry till recently rare in our language and which we sometimes find among the italians in their rima piace voli or poesie burlesca which do not always consist of low humour in a facetious style with jingling rhymes to which form we attach our idea of a burlesque poem there is a refined species of ludicrous poetry which is comic yet tender lusory yet elegant and with such a blending of the serious and the facetious that the result of such a poem may often among its other pleasures produce a sort of ambiguity so that we do not always know whether the writer is laughing at his subject or whether he is to be laughed at our admirable whistlecraft met this fate footnote prospectus and specimen of an intended national work by william and robert whistlecraft of stowe market in suffolk harness and collar makers intended to comprise the most interesting particulars relating to king arthur and his round table the real author of mr whistlecraft's specimen was the right honourable j hookham frere who has the merit of having first introduced the italian burlesque style into our literature lord byron composed his beppo confessedly after this example it is he writes a humorous poem in and after the excellent manner of mr whistlecraft who published this specimen only which was little read End of footnote. the schoolmistress of shenstone has been admired for its simplicity and tenderness not for its exquisitely ludicrous turn this discovery i owe to the good fortune of possessing the edition of the schoolmistress which the author printed under his own directions and to his own fancy footnote the original edition was printed in seventeen fifty seven without engravings they occur only in that which is described in our text End of footnote to this piece of ludicrous poetry as he calls it lest it should be mistaken he added a ludicrous index purely to show fools that i am in jest but the fool his subsequent editor who i regret to say was robert dodsley thought proper to suppress this amusing ludicrous index and the consequence is as the poet foresaw that his aim has been mistaken 
the whole history of this poem in this edition may be traced in the printed correspondence of shenstone our poet had pleased himself by ornamenting a sixpenny pamphlet with certain seemly designs of his and for which he came to town to direct the engraver he appears also to have intended accompanying it with the deformed portrait of my old school dame sarah lloyd the frontispiece to this first edition represents the thatched house of his old schoolmistress and before it is the birch tree with the sun setting and gilding the scene he writes on this i have the first sheet to correct upon the table i have laid aside the thoughts of fame a good deal in this unpromising scheme and fixed them upon the landscape which is engraving the red letter which i propose and the fruit piece which you see being the most seemly ornaments of the first sixpenny pamphlet that was ever so highly honoured i shall incur the same reflection with ogleby of having nothing good but my decorations i expect that in your neighbourhood and in warwickshire there should be twenty of my poems sold i print it myself i am pleased with mine's engravings on the publication shenstone has opened his idea on its poetical characteristic i dare say it must be very incorrect for i have added eight or ten stanzas within this fortnight but inaccuracy is more excusable in ludicrous poetry than in any other if it strikes any it must be merely people of taste for people of wit without taste which comprehends the larger part of the critical tribe will unavoidably despise it i have been at some pains to recover myself from a fi asterisk 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 misfortune of mere childishness little charm of placid mien etc i have added a ludicrous index purely to show fools that i am in jest and my motto o qua so habitabilis illustrat orus maxima principum is calculated for the same purpose you cannot conceive how large the number is of those that mistake burlesque for the very foolishness it exposes which observation i made once at the rehearsal at tom thumb at chrono hotonthologus all which are pieces of elegant humour i have some mind to pursue this caution further and advertise it the schoolmistress etc a very childish performance everybody knows no warum more but if a person seriously calls this or rather burlesque a childish or low species of poetry he says wrong for the most regular and formal poetry may be called trifling folly and weakness in comparison of what is written with a more manly spirit in ridicule of it this edition is now lying before me with its splendid red letter its seemly designs and what is more precious its index shenstone who had greatly pleased himself with his graphical inventions at length found that his engraver mind had sadly bungled with the poet's ideal vexed and disappointed he writes i have been plagued to death about the ill execution of my designs nothing is certain in london but expense which i can ill bear the truth is that what is placed in the landscape over the thatched house and the birch tree is like a falling monster rather than a setting sun but the fruit piece at the end the grapes the plums the melon and the catherine pears mr mind has made sufficiently tempting this edition contains only twenty-eight stanzas which were afterwards enlarged to thirty-five several stanzas have been omitted and they have also passed through many corrections and some improvements which show that shenstone had more judgment and felicity in severe correction than perhaps is suspected some of these i will point out footnote i have usually found the schoolmistress printed without numbering the stanzas to enter into the present view it will be necessary for the reader to do this himself with a pencil mark in the second stanza 
the first edition has in every mart that stands on britain's isle in every village less revealed to fame dwells there in cottage known about a mile a matron old whom we schoolmistress name improved thus in every village marked with little spire embowered in trees and hardly known to fame there dwells in lowly shed and mean attire a matron old whom we schoolmistress name the eighth stanza in the first edition runs the gown which o'er her shoulders thrown she had was russet stuff who knows not russet stuff great comfort to her mind that she was clad in texture of her own all strong and tough nay did she e'er complain nay deem it rough etc more elegantly descriptive is the dress as now delineated a russet stole was o'er her shoulders thrown a russet kirtle fenced the nipping air twas simple russet but it was her own twas her own country bred the flock so fair twas her own labour did the fleece prepare etc the additions made to the first edition consist of the eleven twelve thirteen fourteen and fifteenth stanzas in which are so beautifully introduced the herbs and garden stores and the psalmody of the schoolmistress the twenty ninth and thirtieth stanzas were also subsequent insertions but those lines which give so original a view of genius in its infancy a little bench of heedless bishops here and there a chancellor in embryo etc were printed in seventeen forty two and i cannot but think that the far-famed stanza in gray's elegy where he discovers men of genius in peasants as shenstone has in children was suggested by this original conception some mute inglorious milton here may rest some cromwell guiltless of his country's blood is to me a congenial thought with an echoed turn of expression of the lines from the school mistress i shall now restore the ludicrous index and adapt it to the stanzas of the later edition introduction stanza one the subject proposed two a circumstance in the situation of the mansion of early discipline discovering the surprising influence of the connection of ideas three a simile introducing a deprecation of the joyless effects of bigotry and superstition four some peculiarities indicative of a country school with a short sketch of the sovereign presiding over it five some account of her nightcap apron and a tremendous description of her birchen sceptre six a parallel instance of the advantages of legal government with regard to children and the wind seven her gown eight her titles and punctilious nicety in the ceremonious assertion of them a digression concerning her hands presumptuous behaviour with a circumstance tending to give the cautious reader a more accurate idea of the officious diligence and economy of an old woman ten a view of this rural potentate as seated in her chair of state conferring honours distributing bounties and dispersing proclamations sixteen her policies seventeen the action of the poem commences with a general summons follows a particular description of the artful structure decoration and fortifications of an horn bible eighteen a surprising picture of sisterly affection by way of episode twenty twenty one a short list of the methods now in use to avoid a whipping which nevertheless follows twenty two the force of example twenty three a sketch of the particular symptoms of obstinacy as they discover themselves in a child with a simile illustrating a blubbered face twenty four twenty five twenty six a hint of great importance twenty seven the piety of the poet in relation to that school dame's memory who had the first formation of a certain patriot this stanza has been left out in the later editions it refers to the duke of argyle 
the secret connection between whipping and rising in the world with a view as it were through a perspective of the same little folk in the highest posts and reputation twenty eight an account of the nature of an embryo fox hunter another stanza omitted a deviation to an huckster's shop thirty two which being continued for the space of three stanzas gives the author an opportunity of paying his compliments to a particular county which he gladly seizes concluding his piece with respectful mention of the ancient and loyal city of shrewsbury End of section seventy eight Section 79 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. Ben Jonson on Translation. I have discovered a poem by this great poet which has escaped the researches of all his editors. Prefixed to a translation, translation is the theme, with us an unvalued art because our translators have usually been the jobbers of booksellers, but no inglorious one among our French and Italian rivals. In this poem, if the reader's ear be guided by the compressed sense of the mass of lines, he may feel a rhythm which, should they be read like our modern meter, he will find wanting. Here the fullness of the thoughts forms their own cadences. The mind is musical as well as the ear, one verse running into another, and the sense often closing, in the middle of a line, is the club of Hercules. Dryden sometimes succeeded in it, Churchill abused it, and Cowper attempted to revive it. Great force of thought only can wield this verse. On the author, work and translator prefixed to the translation of Matteo Aleman's Spanish Rogue, 1623. Who tracks this author's or translator's pen shall find, that either hath read books and men, to say but one were single. Then it chimes when the old words do speak on the new times, as in this Spanish Proteus, who, though writ but in one tongue was formed with the world's wit and hath the noblest mark of a good book that an ill man dares not securely look upon it but will loathe or let it pass as a deformed faith doth a true glass such books deserve translators of like coat as was the genius wherewith they were wrote and this hath met that one and may be stilled more than the foster father of this child for though spain gave him his first heir and vogue he would be called henceforth the english rogue but that he's too well suited in a cloth finer than was his spanish if my oath will be received in court if not would i hath clothed him so here's all i can supply to your desert who have done it friend and this fair emulation and no envy is when you behold me wish myself the man that would have done that which you only can. Ben Jonson The translator of Guzman was James Mabe, which he disguised under the Spanish pseudonym of Diego Puede Ser. Diego for James, and Puede Ser for Mabe, or Maybe. He translated with the same spirit as his Guzman, Celestina, or the Spanish Baud, that singular tragicomedy, a version still more remarkable. He had resided a considerable time in Spain and was a perfect master of both languages, a rare talent in a translator, and the consequence is that he is a translator of genius. End of section 79《セクション80》of Curiosities of Literature, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli the loves of the lady arabella footnote long after this article was composed miss aiken published her court of james the first that agreeable writer has written her popular volumes without wasting the bloom of life in the dust of libraries and our female historian has not occasioned me to alter a single sentence in these researches End of footnote where london's tower its turrets show so stately by the thames's side fair arabella child of woe for many a day had sat and sighed and as she heard the waves arise and as she heard the bleak winds roar as fast did heave her heartfelt sighs and still so fast her tears did pour arabella stuart in evans's old ballads probably written by mickle the name of arabella stuart mr lodge observes is scarcely mentioned in history the whole life of this lady seems to consist of secret history which probably we cannot now recover the writers who have ventured to weave together her loose and scattered story are ambiguous and contradictory how such slight domestic incidents as her life consisted of could produce results so greatly disproportioned to their apparent cause may always excite our curiosity her name scarcely ever occurs without raising that sort of interest which accompanies mysterious events and more particularly when we discover that this lady is so frequently alluded to by her foreign contemporaries the historians of the lady arabella have fallen into the grossest errors her chief historian has committed a violent injury on her very person which in the history of a female is not the least important in hastily consulting two passages relative to her he applied to the lady arabella the defective understanding and headstrong dispositions of her aunt the countess of shrewsbury and by another misconception of a term as i think asserts that the lady arabella was distinguished neither for beauty nor intellectual qualities footnote morant in the biographia britannica this gross blunder has been detected by mr lodge the other i submit to the reader's judgment a contemporary letter-writer alluding to the flight of arabella and seymour which alarmed the scottish so much more than the english party tells us among other reasons of the little danger of the political influence of the parties themselves over the people that not only their pretensions were far removed but he adds they were ungraceful both in their persons and their houses morant takes the term ungraceful in its modern acceptation but in the style of that day i think ungraceful is opposed to gracious in the eyes of the people meaning that their persons and their houses were not considerable to the multitude would it not be absurd to apply ungraceful in its modern sense to a family or house and had any political danger been expected assuredly it would not have been diminished by the want of personal grace in these lovers i do not recollect any authority for the sense of ungraceful in opposition to gracious but a critical and literary antiquary has sanctioned my opinion End of footnote. this authoritative decision perplexed the modern editor kippis whose researches were always limited kippis had gleaned from oldys's precious manuscripts a single note which shook to its foundations the whole structure before him and he had also found in ballard to his utter confusion some hints that the lady arabella was a learned woman and of a poetical genius though even the writer himself who had recorded this discovery was at a loss to ascertain the fact it is amusing to observe honest george ballard in the same dilemma as honest andrew kippis this lady he says was not more distinguished for the dignity of her birth than celebrated for her fine parts and learning and yet he adds in all the simplicity of his ingenuousness i know so little in relation to the two last accomplishments that i should not have given her a place in these memoirs 
had not mr evelyn put her in his list of learned women and mr phillips milton's nephew introduced her among his modern poetesses the lady arabella for by that name she is usually noticed by her contemporaries rather than by her maiden name of stuart or by her married one of seymour as she latterly subscribed herself was by her affinity with james i and our elizabeth placed near the throne too near it seems for her happiness and quiet footnote she was the only child of charles stuart fifth earl of lennox by elizabeth daughter of sir william cavendish of hardwick in derbyshire and is supposed to have been born in fifteen seventy seven her father unhappily for her was of the royal blood both of england and scotland for he was a younger brother of king henry father of james the sixth and great-grandson through his mother who was daughter of margaret queen of scots to our henry the seventh such is lodge's account of this illustrious misfortune which made the life of a worthy lady wretched in the footnote in their common descent from margaret the elder daughter of henry the seventh she was cousin to the scottish monarch but born an englishwoman which gave her some advantage in a claim to the throne of england her double relation to royalty says mr lodge was equally obnoxious to the jealousy of elizabeth and the timidity of james and they secretly dreaded the supposed danger of her having a legitimate offspring yet james himself then unmarried proposed for the husband of the lady arabella one of her cousins lord esme stuart whom he had created duke of lennox and designed for his heir the first thing we hear of the lady arabella concerns a marriage marriages are the incidents of her life and the fatal event which terminated it was a marriage such was the secret spring on which her character and her misfortunes revolved this proposed match was desirable to all parties but there was one greater than them all who forbade the bands elizabeth interposed she imprisoned the lady arabella and would not deliver her up to the king of whom she spoke with asperity and even with contempt footnote a circumstance which we discover by a spanish memorial when our james i was negotiating with the cabinet of madrid he complains of elizabeth's treatment of him that the queen refused to give him his father's estate in england nor would deliver up his uncle's daughter arabella to be married to the duke of lennox at which time the queen uso palabras muy asperas y de mucho desprecia contra el dico re des Ascocia she used harsh words expressing much contempt of the king winwood's memorials one four in the footnote the greatest infirmity of elizabeth was her mysterious conduct respecting the succession to the english throne her jealousy of power her strange unhappiness and the dread of personal neglect made her averse to see a successor in her court or even to hear of a distant one in a successor she could only view a competitor camden tells us that she frequently observed that most men neglected the setting sun and this melancholy presentiment of personal neglect this political coquette not only lived to experience but even this circumstance of keeping the succession unsettled miserably disturbed the queen on her deathbed. her ministers it appears harassed her when she was lying speechless a remarkable circumstance which has hitherto escaped the knowledge of her numerous historians and which i shall take an opportunity of disclosing in this work elizabeth leaving a point so important always problematical raised up the very evil she so greatly dreaded it multiplied the aspirants while every party humoured itself by selecting its own claimant and none more busily than the continental powers one of the most curious is the project of the pope who intending to put aside james i on account of his religion formed a chimerical scheme of uniting arabella with a prince of the house of savoy the pretext for without a pretext no politician moves was their descent from a bastard of our edward the fourth the duke of parma was however married but the pope in his infallibility turned his brother the cardinal into the duke's substitute by secularizing the churchman in that case the cardinal would then become king of england in right of this lady 
provided he obtained the crown footnote see a very curious letter the two hundred and ninety ninth of cardinal dosa volume five the catholic interest expected to facilitate the conquest of england by joining their armies with those of arabelle and the commentator writes that this english lady had a party consisting of all those english who had been the judges or the avowed enemies of mary of scotland the mother of james the first in the footnote we might conjecture from this circumstance that arabella was a catholic and so mr butler has recently told us but i know of no other authority than dodd the catholic historian who has inscribed her name among his party parsons the wily jesuit was so doubtful how the lady when young stood disposed towards catholicism that he describes her religion to be as tender green and flexible as is her age and sex and to be wrought hereafter and settled according to future events and times yet in sixteen eleven when she was finally sent into confinement one well informed of court affairs writes that the lady arabella hath not been found inclinable to popery even henry the fourth of france was not unfriendly to this papistical project of placing an italian cardinal on the english throne it had always been the state interest of the french cabinet to favour any scheme which might preserve the realms of england and scotland as separate kingdoms the manuscript correspondence of charles the ninth with his ambassador at the court of london which i have seen tends solely to this great purpose and perhaps it was her french and spanish allies which finally hastened the political martyrdom of the scottish mary thus we have discovered two chimerical husbands of the lady arabella the pretensions of this lady to the throne had evidently become an object with speculating politicians and perhaps it was to withdraw herself from the embarrassments into which she was thrown that according to de tu she intended to marry a son of the earl of northumberland but to the jealous terror of elizabeth an english earl was not an object of less magnitude than a scotch duke this is the third shadowy husband when james i ascended the english throne there existed an anti-scottish party hardly had the northern monarch entered into the land of promise when his southern throne was shaken by a foolish plot which one writer calls a state riddle it involved raleigh and unexpectedly the lady arabella the scottish monarch was to be got rid of and arabella was to be crowned some of these silly conspirators having written to her requesting letters to be addressed to the king of spain she laughed at the letter she received and sent it to the king thus for a second time was arabella to have been queen of england this occurred in sixteen o three but was followed by no harsh measures from james the first in the following year sixteen o four i have discovered that for the third time the lady was offered a crown a great ambassador is coming from the king of poland whose chief errand is to demand my lady arabella in marriage for his master so may your princess of the blood grow a great queen and then we shall be safe from the danger of missuperscribing letters footnote this manuscript letter from william earl of pembroke to gilbert earl of shrewsbury is dated from hampton court october three sixteen o four sloan manuscripts four one six one end of footnote this last passage seems to allude to something what is meant by the danger of missuperscribing letters if this royal offer were ever made it was certainly forbidden can we imagine the refusal to have come from the lady who we shall see seven years afterwards complained that the king had neglected her in not providing her with a suitable match it was at this very time that one of those butterflies who quiver on the fair flowers of a court writes that my lady arabella spends her time in lecture reading etc and she will not hear of marriage indirectly there were speeches used in the recommendation of count maurice who pretendeth to be duke of gildress i dare not attempt her footnote 
lodge's illustrations of british history three two eighty six it is curious to observe that this letter by w fowler is dated on the same day as the manuscript letter i have just quoted and it is directed to the same earl of shrewsbury so that the earl must have received in one day accounts of two different projects of marriage for his niece this shows how much arabella engaged the designs of foreigners and natives will fowler was a rhyming and fantastical secretary to the queen of james the first End of footnote. here we find another princely match proposed thus far to the lady arabella crowns and husbands were like a fairy banquet seen at moonlight opening on her sight impalpable and vanishing at the moment of approach arabella from certain circumstances was a dependent on the king's bounty which flowed very unequally often reduced to great personal distress we find by her letters that she prayed for present money though it should not be annually i have discovered that james at length granted her a pension the royal favours however were probably limited to her good behaviour two letters of arabella on distress of money are preserved by ballard the discovery of a pension i made in sir julius caesar's manuscripts where one is mentioned of sixteen hundred pounds to the lady arabella sloane manuscripts four one six zero mr lodge has shown that the king once granted her the duty on oats End of footnote. from sixteen o four to sixteen o eight is a period which forms a blank leaf in the story of arabella in this last year this unfortunate lady had again fallen out of favour and as usual the cause was mysterious and not known even to the writer chamberlain in a letter to sir ralph winwood mentions the lady arabella's business whatsoever it was is ended and she restored to her former place and graces the king gave her a cupboard of plate better than two hundred pounds for a new year's gift and a thousand marks to pay her debts besides some yearly addition to her maintenance want being thought the chiefest cause of her discontentment though she be not altogether free from suspicion of being collapsed another mysterious expression which would seem to allude either to politics or religion but the fact appears by another writer to have been a discovery of a new project of marriage without the king's consent this person of her choice is not named and it was to divert her mind from the too constant object of her thoughts that james after a severe reprimand had invited her to partake of the festivities of the court in that season of revelry and reconciliation we now approach that event of the lady arabella's life which reads like a romantic fiction the catastrophe too is formed by the aristotelian canon for its misery its pathos and its terror even romantic fiction has not exceeded it is probable that the king from some political motive had decided that the lady arabella should lead a single life but such wise purposes frequently meet with cross ones and it happened that no woman was ever more solicited to the conjugal state or seems to have been so little averse to it every noble youth who sighed for distinction ambitioned the notice of the lady arabella and she was so frequently contriving a marriage for herself that a courtier of that day writing to another observes these affectations of marriage in her do give some advantage to the world of impairing the reputation of her constant and virtuous disposition the revels of christmas had hardly closed when the lady arabella forgot that she had been forgiven and again relapsed into her old infirmity she renewed a connection which had commenced in childhood with mr william seymour the second son of lord beauchamp and grandson of the earl of hertford his character has been finely described by clarendon he loved his studies and his repose but when the civil wars broke out he closed his volumes and drew his sword and was both an active and a skilful general charles i created him marquis of hertford and governor of the prince he lived to the restoration and charles the second restored him to the dukedom of somerset 
this treaty of marriage was detected in february sixteen o nine and the parties summoned before the privy council seymour was particularly censured for daring to ally himself with the royal blood although that blood was running in his own veins in a manuscript letter which i have discovered seymour addressed the lords of the privy council the style is humble the plea to excuse his intended marriage is that being but a young brother and sensible of mine own good unknown to the world of mean estate not born to challenge anything by my birthright and therefore my fortunes to be raised by mine own endeavour and she a lady of great honour and virtue and as i thought of great means i did plainly and honestly endeavour lawfully to gain her in marriage there is nothing romantic in this apology in which seymour describes himself as a fortune hunter which however was probably done to cover his undoubted affection for arabella whom he had early known he says that he conceived that this noble lady might without offence make the choice of any subject within this kingdom which conceit was begotten in me upon a general report after her ladyship's last being called before your lordships that it might be footnote this evidently alludes to the gentleman whose name appears not which occasioned arabella to incur the king's displeasure before christmas the lady arabella it is quite clear was resolvedly bent on marrying herself End of footnote he tells the story of this ancient wooing i boldly intruded myself into her ladyship's chamber in the court on candlemas day last at what time i imparted my desire unto her which was entertained but with this caution on either part that both of us resolved not to proceed to any final conclusion without his majesty's most gracious favour first obtained and this was our first meeting after that we had a second meeting at briggs's house in fleet street and then a third at mr bainton's at both which we had the like conference and resolution as before he assures their lordships that both of them had never intended marriage without his majesty's approbation but love laughs at privy councils and the grave promises made by two frightened lovers the parties were secretly married which was discovered about july in the following year they were then separately confined the lady at the house of sir thomas parry at lambeth and seymour in the tower for his contempt in marrying a lady of the royal family without the king's leave this their first confinement was not rigorous the lady walked in her garden and the lover was a prisoner at large in the tower the writer in the biographia britannica observes that some intercourse they had by letters which after a time was discovered in this history of love these might be precious documents and in the library at long leet these love epistles or perhaps this volume may yet lie unread in a corner footnote it is on record that at longleat the seat of the marquis of bath certain papers of arabella are preserved i leave to the noble owner the pleasure of the research End of footnote. arabella's epistolary talent was not vulgar dr montford in a manuscript letter describes one of those effusions which arabella addressed to the king this letter was penned by her in the best terms as she can do right well it was often read without offence nay it was even commended by his highness with the applause of prince and council one of these amatory letters i have recovered the circumstances domestic being nothing more at first than a very pretty letter on mr seymour having taken cold but as every love-letter ought it is not without a pathetic crescendo the tearing away of hearts so firmly joined her solitary imprisonment availed little for that he lived and was her own filled her spirit with that consciousness which triumphed even over that sickly frame so nearly subdued to death the familiar style of james the first's age may bear comparison with our own i shall give it entire lady arabella to mr william seymour sir i am exceeding sorry to hear you have not been well i pray you let me know truly how you do and what was the cause of it 
i am not satisfied with the reason smith gives for it but if it be a cold i will impute it to some sympathy betwixt us having myself gotten a swollen cheek at the same time with a cold for god's sake let not your grief of mind work upon your body you may see by me what inconveniences it will bring one to and no fortune i assure you daunts me so much as that weakness of body i find in myself for si nous vivons l'âge d'en vaux as moreau says we may by god's grace be happier than we look for in being suffered to enjoy ourself with his majesty's favour but if we be not able to live to it i for my part shall think myself a pattern of misfortune in enjoying so great a blessing as you so little a while no separation but that deprives me of the comfort of you for wheresoever you be or in what state soever you are it sufficeth me you are mine rachel wept and would not be comforted because her children were no more and that indeed is the remediless sorrow and none else and therefore god bless us from that and i will hope well of the rest though i see no apparent hope but i am sure god's book mentioneth many of his children in as great distress that have done well after even in this world i do assure you nothing the state can do with me can trouble me so much as this news of your being ill doth and you see when i am troubled i trouble you too with tedious kindness for so i think you will account so long a letter yourself not having written to me this good while so much as how you do but sweet sir i speak not this to trouble you with writing but when you please be well and i shall account myself happy in being your faithful loving wife a r b period s period in examining the manuscripts of this lady the defective dates must be supplied by our sagacity the following petition as she calls it addressed to the king in defence of her secret marriage must have been written at this time she remonstrates with the king for what she calls his neglect of her and while she fears to be violently separated from her husband she asserts her cause with a firm and noble spirit which was afterwards too severely tried to the king may it please your most excellent majesty i do most heartily lament my hard fortune that i should offend your majesty the least especially in that whereby i have long desired to merit of your majesty as appeared before your majesty was my sovereign and though your majesty's neglect of me my good liking of this gentleman that is my husband and my fortune drew me to a contract before i acquainted your majesty i humbly beseech your majesty to consider how impossible it was for me to imagine it could be offensive to your majesty having few days before given me your royal consent to bestow myself on any subject of your majesty's which likewise your majesty had done long since besides never having been either prohibited any or spoken to for any in this land by your majesty these seven years that i have lived in your majesty's house i could not conceive that your majesty regarded my marriage at all whereas if your majesty had vouchsafed to tell me your mind and accept the free will offering of my obedience i would not have offended your majesty of whose gracious goodness i presume so much that if it were now as convenient in a worldly respect as malice make it seem to separate us whom god hath joined your majesty would not do evil that good might come thereof nor make me that have the honour to be so near your majesty in blood the first precedent that ever was though our princes may have left some as little imitable for so good and gracious a king as your majesty as david's dealing with uriah but i assure myself if it please your majesty in your own wisdom to consider thoroughly of my cause there will no solid reason appear to debar me of justice and your princely favour which i will endeavour to deserve whilst i breathe it is endorsed a copy of my petition to the king's majesty in another she implores that if the necessity of my state and fortune together with my weakness have caused me to do somewhat not pleasing to your majesty let it be all covered with the shadow of your royal benignity again in another petition she writes touching the offence for which i am now punished i most humbly beseech your majesty in your most princely wisdom and judgment to consider in what a miserable state i have been if i had taken any other course than i did for my own conscience witnessing before god that i was then the wife of him that now i am i could never have matched any other man but to have lived all the days of my life as a harlot 
which your majesty would have abhorred in any especially in one who hath the honour how otherwise unfortunate soever to have any drop of your majesty's blood in them i find the letter of lady jane drummond in reply to this or another petition which lady drummond had given the queen to present to his majesty it was to learn the cause of arabella's confinement the pithy expression of james i is characteristic of the monarch and the solemn forebodings of lady drummond who appears to have been a lady of excellent judgment showed by the fate of arabella how they were true lady jane drummond to lady arabella answering her prayer to know the cause of her confinement this day her majesty hath seen your ladyship's letter her majesty says that when she gave your ladyship's petition to his majesty he did take it well enough but gave no other answer than that ye had eaten of the forbidden tree this was all her majesty commanded me to say to your ladyship in this purpose but withal did remember her kindly to your ladyship and sent you this little token in witness of the continuance of her majesty's favour to your ladyship now where your ladyship desires me to deal openly and freely with you i protest i can say nothing on knowledge for i never spoke to any of that purpose but to the queen but the wisdom of this state with the example how some of your quality in the like case has been used makes me fear that ye shall not find so easy end to your troubles as ye expect or i wish in return lady arabella expresses her grateful thanks presents her majesty with this piece of my work to accept in remembrance of the poor prisoner that wrought them in hopes her royal hands will vouchsafe to wear them which till i have the honour to kiss i shall live in a great deal of sorrow her case she adds could be compared to no other she ever heard of resembling no other arabella like the queen of scots beguiled the hours of imprisonment by works of embroidery for in sending a present of this kind to sir andrew sinclair to be presented to the queen she thanks him for vouchsafing to descend to these petty offices to take care even of these womanish toys for her whose serious mind must invent some relaxation the secret correspondence of arabella and seymour was discovered and was followed by a sad scene it must have been now that the king resolved to consign this unhappy lady to the stricter care of the bishop of durham lady arabella was so subdued at this distant separation that she gave way to all the wildness of despair she fell suddenly ill and could not travel but in a litter and with a physician in her way to durham she was so greatly disquieted in the first few miles of her uneasy and troublesome journey that they would proceed no further than highgate the physician returned to town to report her state and declared that she was assuredly very weak her pulse dull and melancholy and very irregular her countenance very heavy pale and wan and though free from fever he declared her in no case fit for travel the king observed it is enough to make any sound man sick to be carried in a bed in that manner she is much more for her whose impatient and unquiet spirit heapeth upon herself far greater indisposition of body than otherwise she would have his resolution however was that she should proceed to durham if he were king we answered replied the doctor that we made no doubt of her obedience obedience is that required replied the king which being performed i will do more for her than she expected footnote these particulars i derive from the manuscript letters among the papers of arabella stuart harley manuscripts seven zero zero three in the footnote the king however with his usual indulgence appears to have consented that lady arabella should remain for a month at highgate in confinement till she had sufficiently recovered to proceed to durham where the bishop posted unaccompanied by his charge to await her reception and to the great relief of the friends of the lady who hoped she was still within the reach of their cares or of the royal favour a second month's delay was granted in consequence of that letter which we have before noticed as so impressive and so elegant that it was commended by the king and applauded by prince henry and the council 
but the day of her departure hastened and the lady arabella betrayed no symptom of her first despair she openly declared her resignation to her fate and showed her obedient willingness by being even over careful in little preparations to make easy a long journey such tender grief had won over the hearts of her keepers who could not but sympathize with a princess whose love holy and wedded too was crossed only by the tyranny of statesmen but arabella had not within that tranquillity with which she had lulled her keepers she and seymour had concerted a flight as bold in its plot and as beautifully wild as any recorded in romantic story the day preceding her departure arabella found it not difficult to persuade a female attendant to consent that she would suffer her to pay a last visit to her husband and to wait for her return at an appointed hour more solicitous for the happiness of lovers than for the repose of kings this attendant in utter simplicity or with generous sympathy assisted the lady arabella in dressing her in one of the most elaborate disguisings she drew a pair of large french fashioned hose or trousers over her petticoats put on a man's doublet or coat a peruke such as men wore whose long locks covered her own ringlets a black hat a black coat russet boots with red tops and a rapier by her side thus accoutred the lady arabella stole out with a gentleman about three o'clock in the afternoon she had only proceeded a mile and a half when they stopped at a poor inn where one of her confederates was waiting with horses yet she was so sick and faint that the ostler who held her stirrup observed that the gentleman could hardly hold out to london she recruited her spirits by riding the blood mantled in her face and at six o'clock our sick lover reached blackwall where a boat and servants were waiting the watermen were at first ordered to woolwich there they were desired to push on to gravesend then to tilbury where complaining of fatigue they landed to refresh but tempted by their freight they reached lee at the break of morn they discovered a french vessel riding there to receive the lady but as seymour had not yet arrived arabella was desirous to lie at anchor for her lord conscious that he would not fail to his appointment if he indeed had been prevented in his escape she herself cared not to preserve the freedom she now possessed but her attendants aware of the danger of being overtaken by a king's ship overruled her wishes and hoisted sail which occasioned so fatal a termination to this romantic adventure seymour indeed had escaped from the tower he had left his servant watching at the door to warn all visitors not to disturb his master who lay ill of a raging toothache while seymour in disguise stole away alone following a cart which had brought wood to his apartment he passed the warders he reached the wharf and found his confidential man waiting with a boat and he arrived at lee the time pressed the waves were rising arabella was not there but in the distance he descried a vessel hiring a fisherman to take him on board to his grief on hailing it he discovered that it was not the french vessel charged with his arabella in despair and confusion he found another ship from newcastle which for a good sum altered its course and landed him in flanders in the meanwhile the escape of arabella was first known to government and the hot alarm which spread may seem ludicrous to us the political consequences attached to the union and the flight of these two doves from their coats shook with consternation the grey owls of the cabinet more particularly the scotch party who in their terror paralleled it with the gunpowder treason and some political danger must have impended at least in their imagination for prince henry partook of this cabinet panic confusion and alarm prevailed at court couriers were dispatched swifter than the winds wafted the unhappy arabella and all was hurry in the seaports they sent to the tower to warn the lieutenant to be doubly vigilant over seymour who to his surprise discovered that his prisoner had ceased to be so for several hours james at first was for issuing a proclamation in a style so angry and vindictive that it required the moderation of cecil to preserve the dignity while he concealed the terror of his majesty by the admiral's detail of his impetuous movements he seemed in pursuit of an enemy's fleet 
for the courier is urged and the postmasters are roused by a superscription which warned them of the eventful dispatch haste haste post haste haste for your life your life footnote this emphatic injunction observed a friend would be effective when the messenger could read but in a letter written by the earl of essex about the year fifteen ninety seven to the lord high admiral at plymouth i have seen added to the words hast 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 for life the expressive symbol of a gallows prepared with a halter which could not be well misunderstood by the most illiterate of mercuries thus rectangle with parentheses in a line representing a hangman's rope in the footnote the family of the seymours were in a state of distraction and a letter from mr francis seymour to his grandfather the earl of hartford residing then at his seat far remote from the capital to acquaint him of the escape of his brother and the lady still bears to posterity a remarkable evidence of the trepidation and consternation of the old earl it arrived in the middle of the night accompanied by a summons to attend the privy council in the perusal of a letter written in a small hand and filling more than two folio pages such was his agitation that in holding the taper he must have burnt what he probably had not read the letter is scorched and the flame has perforated it in so critical a part that the poor old earl journeyed to town in a state of uncertainty and confusion nor was his terror so unreasonable as it seems treason had been a political calamity with the seymours their progenitor the duke of somerset the protector had found that all his honours as franklin strangely expresses it had helped him too forwards to hop headless henry elizabeth and james says the same writer considered that it was needful as indeed in all sovereignties that those who were nearest the crown should be narrowly looked into for marriage but we have left the lady arabella alone and mournful on the seas not praying for favourable gales to convey her away but still imploring her attendants to linger for her seymour still straining her sight to the point of the horizon for some speck which might give a hope of the approach of the boat freighted with all her love alas never more was arabella to cast a single look on her lover and her husband she was overtaken by a pink in the king's service in calais roads and now she declared that she cared not to be brought back again to her imprisonment should seymour escape whose safety was dearest to her the life of the unhappy the melancholy and the distracted arabella stuart is now to close in an imprisonment which lasted only four years for her constitutional delicacy her rooted sorrow and the violence of her feelings sunk beneath the hopelessness of her situation and a secret resolution in her mind to refuse the aid of her physicians and to wear away the faster if she could the feeble remains of life but who shall paint the emotions of a mind which so much grief and so much love and distraction itself equally possessed what passed in that dreadful imprisonment cannot perhaps be recovered for authentic history but enough is known that her mind grew impaired that she finally lost her reason and if the duration of her imprisonment was short it was only terminated by her death Footnote lodge says she was remanded to the tower where she soon afterwards sank into helpless idiocy surviving in that wretched state till september sixteen fifteen when with miserable mockery of state she was buried in westminster abbey beside the body of henry prince of wales bishop corbett wrote some lines on her death very indicative of the poor lady's thoughts how do i thank ye death and bless thy power that i have passed the guard and scaped the tower and now my pardon is my epitaph and a small coffin my poor carcass hath for at thy charge both soul and body were enlarged at last secured from hope and fear that amongst saints this amongst kings is laid and what my birth did claim my death hath paid End of footnote. some loose effusions often begun and never ended written and erased incoherent and rational yet remain in the fragments of her papers in a letter she proposed addressing to viscount fenton to employ for her his majesty's favour again she says good my lord consider the fault cannot be uncommitted 
neither can any more be required of any earthly creature but confession and most humble submission in a paragraph she had written but crossed out it seems that a present of her work had been refused by the king and that she had no one about her whom she might trust help will come too late and be assured that neither physician nor other but whom i think good shall come about me while i live till i have his majesty's favour without which i desire not to live and if you remember of old i dare die so i be not guilty of my own death and oppress others with my ruin too if there be no other way as god forbid to whom i commit you and rest as assuredly as heretofore if you be the same to me your lordship's faithful friend a s that she had frequently meditated on suicide appears by another letter i could not be so unchristian as to be the cause of my own death consider what the world would conceive if i should be violently enforced to do it one fragment we may save as an evidence of her utter wretchedness in all humility the most wretched and unfortunate creature that ever lived prostrates itself at the feet of the most merciful king that ever was desiring nothing but mercy and favour not being more afflicted for anything than for the loss of that which hath been this long time the only comfort it had in the world and which if it were to do again i would not adventure the loss of for any other worldly comfort mercy it is i desire and that for god's sake such is the history of the lady arabella who from some circumstances not sufficiently open to us was an important personage designed by others at least to play a high character in the political drama thrice selected as a queen but the consciousness of royalty was only felt in her veins while she lived in the poverty of dependence many gallant spirits aspired after her hand but when her heart secretly selected one beloved it was for ever deprived of domestic happiness she is said not to have been beautiful and to have been beautiful and her very portrait ambiguous as her life is neither the one nor the other she is said to have been a poetess but not a single verse substantiates her claim to the laurel she is said not to have been remarkable for her intellectual accomplishments yet i have found a latin letter of her composition in her manuscripts the materials of her life are so scanty that it cannot be written and yet we have sufficient reason to believe that it would be as pathetic as it would be extraordinary could we narrate its involved incidents and paint forth her delirious feelings acquainted rather with her conduct than with her character for us the lady arabella has no palpable historical existence and we perceive rather her shadow than herself a writer of romance might render her one of those interesting personages whose griefs have been deepened by their royalty and whose adventures touched with the warm hues of love and distraction closed at the bars of her prison gate a sad example of a female victim to the state through one dim lattice fringed with ivy round successive suns a languid radiance threw to paint how fierce her angry guardian frowned to mark how fast her waning beauty flew seymour who was afterwards permitted to return distinguished himself by his loyalty through three successive reigns and retained his romantic passion for the lady of his first affections for he called the daughter he had by his second lady by the ever-beloved name of arabella stuart end of section eighty section eighty one of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli domestic history of sir edward cook sir edward coke or cook as now pronounced and occasionally so written in his own times that lord chief justice whose name the laws of england will preserve has shared the fate of his great rival the lord chancellor bacon for no hand worthy of their genius has pursued their story bacon busied with nature forgot himself cook who was only the greatest of lawyers reflected with more complacency on himself for among those thirty books which he had written with his own hand most pleasing to himself was a manual which he called wade makem 
from whence at one view he took a prospect of his life past this manuscript which lloyd notices was among the fifty which on his death were seized on by an order of council but some years after were returned to his heir and this precious memorial may still be disinterred footnote this conjecture may not be vain since this has been written i have heard that the papers of sir edward cook are still preserved at holcombe the seat of mr cook and i have also heard of others in the possession of a noble family the late mr roscoe told me that he was preparing a beautifully embellished catalogue of the holcombe library in which the taste of the owner would rival his munificence a list of those manuscripts to which i allude may be discovered in the lambeth manuscripts number nine four three article three sixty nine described in the catalogue as a note of such things as were found in a trunk of sir edward cook's by the king's command sixteen thirty four but more particularly in article three seventy one a catalogue of sir edward cook's papers then seized and brought to whitehall in the footnote cook was the oracle of law but like too many great lawyers he was so completely one as to have been nothing else cook has said the common law is the absolute perfection of all reason a dictum which might admit of some ridicule armed with law he committed acts of injustice for in how many cases passion mixing itself with law summum jus becomes summa injuria official violence brutalized and political ambition extinguished every spark of nature in this great lawyer when he struck at his victims public or domestic his solitary knowledge perhaps had deadened his judgment in other studies and yet his narrow spirit could shrink with jealousy at the celebrity obtained by more liberal pursuits than his own the errors of the great are as instructive as their virtues and the secret history of the outrageous lawyer may have at least the merit of novelty although not of panegyric cook already enriched by his first marriage combined power with added wealth in his union with the relict of sir william hatton the sister of thomas lord burleigh family alliance was the policy of that prudent age of political interests bacon and cecil married two sisters walsingham and mildmay two others knowles essex and leicester were linked by family alliances elizabeth who never designed to marry herself was anxious to intermarry her court dependents and to dispose of them so as to secure their services by family interests ambition and avarice which had instigated cook to form this alliance punished their creature by mating him with a spirit haughty and intractable as his own it is a remarkable fact connected with the character of cook that this great lawyer suffered his second marriage to take place in an illegal manner and condescended to plead ignorance of the laws he had been married in a private house without bans or license at a moment when the archbishop was vigilantly prosecuting informal and irregular marriages cook with his habitual pride imagined that the rank of the parties concerned would have set him above such restrictions the laws which he administered he appears to have considered had their indulgent exceptions for the great but whitgift was a primitive christian and the circumstance involved cook and the whole family in a prosecution in the ecclesiastical court and nearly in the severest of its penalties the archbishop appears to have been fully sensible of the overbearing temper of this great lawyer for when cook became the attorney-general we cannot but consider as an ingenious reprimand the archbishop's gift of a greek testament with this message that he had studied the common law long enough and should henceforward study the law of god the atmosphere of a court proved variable with so stirring a genius and as a constitutional lawyer cook at times was the stern asserter of the kingly power or its intrepid impugner but his personal dispositions led to predominance and he too often usurped authority and power with the relish of one who loved them too keenly you make the laws too much lean to your opinion whereby you show yourself to be a legal tyrant said lord bacon in his admonitory letter to cook 
In 1616, Cook was out of favor for more causes than one, and his great rival Bacon was paramount at the council table. Footnote. Miss Aitken's Court of James I appeared two years after this article was written. It has occasioned no alteration. I refer the reader to her clear narrative to page 30 and page 63. But secret history is rarely discovered in printed books. End of footnote. Perhaps Cook felt more humiliated by appearing before his judges, who were every one inferior to him as lawyers, than by the weak triumph of his enemies, who received him with studied insult. The Queen informed the King of the treatment the disgraced Lord Chief Justice had experienced, and in an angry letter James declared that he prosecuted Cook ad correctionem, not ad destructionem and afterwards at the council spoke of Cook with so many good words as if he meant to hang him with a silken halter. Even his rival Bacon made this memorable acknowledgment in reminding the judges that such a man was not every day to be found, nor so soon made as marred. When his successor was chosen, the Lord Chancellor Egerton, in administering the oath, accused Cook of many errors and vanities for his ambitious popularity. Cook, however, lost no friends in this disgrace, nor lost his haughtiness, for when the new Chief Justice sent to purchase his collar of S.S. Cook returned for answer, that he would not part with it, but leave it to his posterity, that they might one day know they had a Chief Justice to their ancestor. Footnote. These particulars I find in the manuscript letters of J. Chamberlain, Sloan Manuscripts, 4172-1616. In the quaint style of the times, the common speech ran that Lord Cook had been overthrown by four P's, pride, prohibitions, premunir, and prerogative. It is only with his moral quality and not with his legal controversies that his personal character is here concerned. End of footnote. In this temporary alienation of the royal smiles, Cook attempted their renewal by a project which involved a domestic sacrifice. When the king was in Scotland, and Lord Bacon, as Lord Keeper, sat at the head of affairs, his lordship was on ill terms with Secretary Winwood, whom Cook easily persuaded to resume a former proposal for marrying his only daughter to the favorite's eldest brother, Sir John Villiers. Cook had formally refused this match from the high demands of these parvenus. Cook, in prosperity, sticking at ten thousand a year, and resolving to give only ten thousand marks, dropped some idle words that he would not buy the king's favor too dear. But now, in his adversity, his ambition proved stronger than his avarice, and by this stroke of deep policy, the wily lawyer was converting a mere domestic transaction into an affair of state, which it soon became. As such, it was evidently perceived by Bacon. He was alarmed at this projected alliance, in which he foresaw that he should lose his hold of the favorite in the inevitable rise once more of his rival Cook. Bacon, the illustrious philosopher, whose eye was only blessed in observing nature, and whose mind was only great in recording his own meditations, now sat down to contrive the most subtle suggestions he could put together to prevent this match. But Lord Bacon not only failed in persuading the king to refuse what his majesty much wished, but finally produced the very mischief he sought to avert, a rupture with Buckingham himself and a copious scolding letter from the king but a very admirable one footnote in the lambeth manuscripts nine three six is a letter of lord bacon to the king to prevent the match between sir john villiers and mrs cook article sixty three another article sixty nine the spirited and copious letter of james to the lord keeper is printed in letters speeches charges etc of francis bacon by dr birch page one hundred and thirty three end of footnote and where the lord keeper trembled to find himself called mr bacon there were however other personages than his majesty and his favourite more deeply concerned in this business and who had not hitherto been once consulted the mother and the daughter 
Cook, who in everyday concerns issued his commands as he would his law writs, and at times boldly asserted the rights of the subject, had no other paternal notion of the duties of a wife and a child than their obedience. Lady Hatton, haughty to insolence, had been often forbidden both the courts of their majesties, where Lady Compton, the mother of Buckingham, was the object of her ladyship's persevering contempt she retained her personal influence by the numerous estates which she enjoyed in right of her former husband when cook fell into disgrace his lady abandoned him and to avoid her husband frequently moved her residences in town and country i trace her with malicious activity disfurnishing his house in holborn and at stoke pogus footnote stoke pogus buckinghamshire the delightful seat of j pen esq it was the scene of gray's long story and the chimneys of the ancient house still remain to mark the locality a column on which is fixed a statue of cook erected by mr pen consecrates the former abode of its illustrious inhabitant End of footnote seizing on all the plate and movables and in fact leaving the fallen statesman and the late lord chief justice empty houses and no comforter the wars between lady hatton and her husband were carried on before the council board where her ladyship appeared accompanied by an imposing train of noble friends with her accustomed haughty airs and in an imperial style lady hatton declaimed against her tyrannical husband so that the letter writer adds divers said that burbage could not have acted better burbage's famous character was that of richard the third it is extraordinary that cook able to defend any cause bore himself so simply it is supposed that he had laid his domestic concerns too open to animadversion in the neglect of his daughter or that he was aware that he was standing before no friendly bar at that moment being out of favour whatever was the cause our noble virago obtained a signal triumph and the oracle of law with all his gravity stood before the council table henpecked in june sixteen sixteen sir edward appears to have yielded at discretion to his lady for in an unpublished letter i find that his cursed heart hath been forced to yield to more than he ever meant but upon this agreement he flatters himself that she will prove a very good wife in the following year sixteen seventeen these domestic affairs totally changed the political marriage of his daughter with villiers being now resolved on the business was to clip the wings of so fierce a bird as cook had found in lady hatton which led to an extraordinary contest the mother and daughter hated the upstart villiers and sir john indeed promised to be but a sickly bridegroom they had contrived to make up a written contract of marriage with lord oxford which they opposed against the proposal or rather the order of cook the violence to which the towering spirits of the conflicting parties proceeded is a piece of secret history of which accident has preserved an able memorial cook armed with law and what was at least equally potent with the king's favour entered by force the barricadoed houses of his lady took possession of his daughter on whom he appears never to have cast a thought till she became an instrument for his political purposes confined her from her mother and at length got the haughty mother herself imprisoned and brought her to account for all her past misdoings quick was the change of scene and the contrast was as wonderful cook who in the preceding year to the world's surprise proved so simple an advocate in his own cause in the presence of his wife now to employ his own words got upon his wings again and went on as lady hatton when safely lodged in prison describes with his high-handed tyrannical courses till the furious lawyer occasioned a fit of sickness to the proud crestfallen lady law 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 thundered from the lips of its oracle and lord bacon in his apologetical letter to the king for having opposed his riot or violence says i disliked it the more because he justified it to be law which was his old song 
the memorial alluded to appears to have been confidentially composed by the legal friend of lady hatton to furnish her ladyship with answers when brought before the council table it opens several domestic scenes in the house of that great lord chief justice but the forcible simplicity of the style in domestic details will show what i have often observed that our language has not advanced in expression since the age of james i i have transcribed it from the original and its interest must plead for its length to lady hatton tenth july sixteen seventeen madam seeing these people speak no language but thunder and lightning accounting this their cheapest and best way to work upon you i would with patience prepare myself to their extremities and study to defend the breaches by which to their advantage they suppose to come in upon me and henceforth quit the ways of pacification and composition heretofore and unseasonably endeavoured which in my opinion lie most open to trouble scandal and danger wherefore i will briefly set down their objections and such answers to them as i conceive proper the first is you conveyed away your daughter from her father answer i had cause to provide for her quiet secretary winwood threatening that she should be married from me in spite of my teeth and sir edward cook daily tormenting the girl with discourses tending to bestow her against her liking which he said she was to submit to his besides my daughter daily complained and sought to me for help whereupon as heretofore i had, had accustomed i bestowed her apart at my cousin german's house for a few days for her health and quiet till my own business for my estate were ended sir edward cook never asked me where she was no more than at other times when at my placing she had been a quarter of a year from him as the year before with my sister burley second that you endeavoured to bestow her and to bind her to my lord of oxford without her knowledge and consent upon this subject a lawyer by way of invective may open his mouth wide and anticipate every hearer's judgment by the rights of a father this dangerous in the precedent to others to which nevertheless this answer may be justly returned answer my daughter as aforesaid terrified with her father's threats and hard usage and pressing me to find some remedy from this violence intended i did compassionate her condition and bethought myself of this contract to my lord of oxford if so she liked and thereupon i gave it to her to peruse and consider by herself which she did she liked it cheerfully writ it out with her own hand subscribed it and returned it to me wherein i did nothing of my own will but followed hers after i saw she was so averse to sir thomas villiers that she voluntarily and deliberately protested that of all men living she would never have him nor could ever fancy him for a husband secondly by this i put her under no new way nor into any other than her father had heretofore known and approved for he saw such letters as my lady of oxford had writ to me thereabouts he never forbade it he never disliked it only he said they were then too young and there was time enough for the treaty thirdly he always left his daughter to my disposing and my bringing up knowing that i i proposed her my fortune and whole estate and as upon these reasons he left her to my cares so he eased himself absolutely of her never meddling with her neglecting her and caring nothing for her the third that you counterfeited a treaty from my lord of oxford to yourself answer i know it not counterfeit but be it so to whose injury if to my lord of oxford's for no man else is therein interested it must be either in honour or in freehold read the treaty it proves neither for it is only a compliment it is no engagement presently nor futurely besides the law shows what forgery is and to counterfeit a private man's hand nay a magistrate's makes not the fault but the cause wherefore secondly the end justifies at the least excuses the fact for it was only to hold up my daughter's mind to her own choice and liking 
for her eyes only and for no others that she might see some retribution and thereby with the more constancy endure her imprisonment having this only antidote to resist the poison of that place company and conversation myself and all her friends barred from her and no person or speech admitted to her ear but such as spoke sir thomas villiers's language the fourth that you plotted to surprise your daughter to take her away by force to the breach of the king's peace and particular commandment and for that purpose had assembled a number of desperate fellows whereof the consequence might have been dangerous and the affront to the king was the greater that such a thing was offered the king being forth of the kingdom which by example might have drawn on other assemblies to more dangerous attempts this field is large for a plentiful babbler answer i know no such matter neither in any place was there such assembly true it is i spoke to turner to provide me some tall fellows for the taking a possession for me in lincolnshire of some land sir william mason had lately deceased me but be it they were assembled and convoked to such an end what was done was any such thing attempted were they upon the place kept they the heath or the highways by ambuscades or was any place any day appointed for a rendezvous no no such matter but something was intended and i pray you what says the law of such a single intention which is not within the view or notice of the law beside who intended this the mother and wherefore because she was unnaturally and barbarously secluded from her daughter and her daughter forced against her will contrary to her vow and liking to the will of him she disliked nay the laws of god of nature of man speak for me and cry out upon them but they had a warrant from the king's order from the commissioners to keep my daughter in their custody yet neither this warrant nor the commissioners did prohibit the mother coming to her but contrarily allowed her then by the same authority might she get to her daughter that sir edward cook had used to keep her from her daughter the husband having no power warrant or permission from god the king or the law to sequester the mother from her own child she only endeavouring the child's good with the child's liking and to her preferment and he his private end against the child's liking without care of her preferment which differing respects as they justify the mother and all so condemned they the father as a transgressor of the rules of nature and as a perverter of his rights as a father and a husband to the hurt both of child and wife lastly if recrimination could lessen the fault take this in the worst sense and naked of all the considerable circumstances it hath what is this nay what had the executing of this intention been comparatively with sir edward cook's most notorious riot committed at my lord of argyle's house when without constable or warrant associated with a dozen fellows well weaponed without cause being beforehand offered to have what he would he took down the doors of the gatehouse and of the house itself and tore the daughter in that barbarous manner from the mother and would not suffer the mother to come near her and when he was before the lords of the council to answer this outrage he justified it to make it good by law and that he feared the face of no greatness a dangerous word for the encouragement of all notorious and rebellious malefactors especially from him that had been the chief justice of the law and of the people reputed the oracle of the law and a most dangerous bravado cast in the teeth and face of the state in the king's absence and therefore most considerable for the maintenance of authority and the quiet of the land for if it be lawful for him with a dozen to enter any man's house thus outrageously for any right to which he pretends it is lawful for any man with one hundred nay with five hundred and consequently with as many as he draw together to do the same which may endanger the safety of the king's person and the peace of the kingdom the fifth that you having certified the king you had received an engagement from my lord of oxford and the king commanding you upon your allegiance to come and bring it to him or to send it him or not having it to signify his name who brought it and where he was you refused all by which you doubled and trebled a high contempt to his majesty answer 
i was so sick on the week before for the most part i kept my bed and even that instant i was so weak as i was not able to rise from it without help nor to endure the air which indisposition and weakness my two physicians sir william paddy and dr atkins can affirm true which so being i hope his majesty will graciously excuse the necessity and not impose a fault whereof i am not guilty and for the sending it i protest to god i had it not and for telling the parties and where he is i most humbly beseech his sacred majesty in his great wisdom and honour to consider how unworthy a part it were in me to bring any man into trouble from which i am so far from redeeming him as i can no way relieve myself and therefore humbly crave his majesty in his princely consideration of my distressed condition to forgive me this reservedness proceeding from that just sense and the rather for that the law of the land and civil causes as i am informed no way tieth me thereunto among the other papers it appears that cook accused his lady of having embezzled all his gilt and silver plate and vessel he having little in any house of mine but that his marriage with me brought him and instead thereof foisted in alchemy footnote, a term then in use for base or mixed metal end of footnote of the same sort fashion and use with the illusion to have cheated him of the other cook insists on the inventory by the schedule her ladyship says i made such plate for matter and form for my own use at purbeck that serving well enough in the country and i was loath to trust such a substance in a place so remote and in the guard of few but for the plate and vessel he saith is wanting they are every ounce within one of my three houses she complains that sir edward cook and his son clement had threatened her servants so grievously that the poor men run away to hide themselves from his fury and dared not appear abroad sir edward broke into hatton house seized upon my coach and coach horses nay my apparel which he detains thrust all my servants out of doors without wages sent down his men to corfe to inventory seize ship and carry away all the goods which being refused him by the castle keeper he threats to bring your lordship's warrant for the performance thereof but your lordship established that he should have the use only of the goods during his life in such houses as the same appertained without meaning i hope of depriving me of such use being goods brought at my marriage or bought with the money i spared for my allowances stop then his high tyrannical courses for i have suffered beyond the measure of any wife mother nay of any ordinary woman in this kingdom without respect to my father my birth my fortunes with which i have so highly raised him what availed the vexation of this sick mortified and proud woman or the more tender feelings of the daughter in this forced marriage to satisfy the political ambition of the father when lord bacon wrote to the king respecting the strange behaviour of cook the king vindicated it for the purpose of obtaining his daughter blaming lord bacon for some expressions he had used and bacon with the servility of the courtier when he found the wind in his teeth tacked round and promised buckingham to promote the match he so much abhorred villiers was married to the daughter of cook at hampton court on michaelmas day sixteen seventeen cook was readmitted to the council table lady hatton was reconciled to lady compton and the queen and gave a grand entertainment on the occasion to which however the good man of the house was neither invited nor spoken of he dined that day at the temple she is still bent to pull down her husband adds my informant the moral close remains to be told lady villiers looked on her husband as the hateful object of a forced union and nearly drove him mad while she disgraced herself by such loose conduct as to be condemned to stand in a white sheet and i believe at length obtained a divorce thus a marriage projected by ambition and prosecuted by violent means closed with that utter misery to the parties with which it had commenced 
and for our present purpose has served to show that when a lawyer like cook holds his high-handed tyrannical courses the law of nature as well as the law of which he is the oracle will be alike violated under his roof wife and daughter were plaintiffs or defendants on whom this lord chief justice closed his ear he had blocked up the avenues to his heart with law 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 his old song beyond his eightieth year in the last parliament of charles i the extraordinary vigour of cook's intellect flamed clear under the snows of age no reconciliation ever took place between the parties on a strong report of his death her ladyship accompanied by her brother lord wimbledon posted down to stoke pogus to take possession of his mansion but beyond colebrook they met with one of his physicians coming from him with the mortifying intelligence of sir edward's amendment on which they returned at their leisure this happened in june sixteen thirty four and on the following september the venerable sage was no more end of section eighty one